Welcome back to a very special Halloween episode of Den of Sin with Devin and James, a movie podcast starring myself, James, and my co-host extraordinaire, Devin. Trick or treat. How are you doing, Devin? Trick or treat. (laughs) I'm doing okay. Oh, I did have something I wanted to show you now that I remember, because I've had this sitting on my desk the last couple of times, but Kylie brought this home to me the other day, a couple weeks ago. Oh, I love it! Nice. (laughs) I love it. I've been actually it's so funny. I've been searching for that exact one. Oh, really? It's a little plush gill man plush, from Creature, Creature from the Black Lagoon. Yes. Little gill what man. company makes that one? Uh, the tag says Toy Factory, and it is licensed Universal Studios Monsters. Yeah. Oh, cool. My coworker but, had one on her desk, and I was like, what? She but, wanted a Dave and Buster's. So that's what I was going to say. I was going to say, that's what I was going to say. It's, I think it's a crane thing because that, yeah, exactly. So Real quick, first off, before I make a second introduction, a special introduction for this episode, returning annual guest, uh, I have to say, Devin, I've been meaning to say this forever. I had gotten your, you sent me uh, the Dream Team uh, Blu-ray, <laughs> and I, was like, I grabbed it, and I was like, oh, thanks, I didn't, you sent it. And I put it on top of my bookcase, and it fell to the back of the bookcase, bookcase basically right out of vision. I completely <laughs> forgot until two days ago, and I was like, oh, I just forgot to thank devin for this but anyways thank you devin for the dream team um <laughs> but ladies and gentlemen we have a returning guest making his second appearance on the den of sin right in time for our annual halloween episode ladies and gentlemen casey o'connor hello everyone hello guys how's it going casey good good glad to be here again good. This glad to for all of us. happy halloween or halloween season it's exactly. not I mean, it's this a- actually on the day yeah, so it's it's like a week away. So from the time we record this, but we'll probably release it closer to. But Lee, you were here last year for the viewers who you know maybe haven't been listening that long. Uh, you were here last year where we talked about the works of John Carpenter, and that was yes, a really sir. great episode. In fact, it's one of my favorite episodes. Same here. Yeah, I liked it. It was fun. It was a fun conversation. So originally we had planned on maybe doing like either the works of Wes Craven or the works of I think we talked about Romero at one point, but that was going to take. So first off, Devin. This is special for you and I because we've never recorded a second episode as quickly as <laughs> we are recording this one. So for those of you that haven't already listened to it, our other very special Halloween episode we had on as a special guest, our first celebrity. Not that Casey, you're not not that you're not a celebrity in our heart. I'm not but, a celebrity at all. Yeah. <laughs> but the first celebrity guest, Dick Dizel, aka the Count Gordeval, the horror host extraordinaire, um, star of the documentary Every Other Day is Halloween. Anyways, he was in our last episode. It was amazing. If you haven't already listened to it, go ahead and check it out. Download it wherever you get your podcasts. But it was a great episode. But we said, you know what? Halloween is a special season. We need to give even more. That's why we had Casey back on uh, for a little fun little. I am calling this episode the fun size grab bag episode where it's a little less for like, you know, Devin, I know you really love your research and you do a lot of preparation. I fly by the seat of my pants just like I do in every other aspect of my life. But this one is going to be a little bit more uh, free form. Let's get right into it. I know, Devin, you wanted to talk about something very specific at the start of the show before we sort of go into basically our lists or our mini grab bags, or whatever. Um, did you want to tell the folks what you wanted to talk about? In terms, like, what was I... Am I, I'm already lost. Uh, the movie, a movie you wanted to talk about, a very recent <laughs> movie that's getting a lot of press. Yes, yes, yes. Okay, I know where you're going. Sorry. This, ladies and gentlemen, listen to this sound. That is the sound of no paper rattling. I have done no research. Like, as James said, this is my first time just going off the seat of my pants. So, uh, yeah, I, I apologize when I hear, like, oh, was I supposed to have something planned? I'm like... <laughs> <laughs> this is like the connor's live episode of denison <laughs> hopefully far better than that but right. yeah hopefully more entertaining <laughs> but anyways that's not what i'm here to talk about we're here to talk about some scary stuff some uh some fun halloween movies and i think there is a distinction i i don't know exactly where the line is drawn and maybe that's something we can discuss over the course of this uh, episode but fun horror movies there's a difference between fun horror movies and funny horror movies because yeah there's a lot of fun stuff that's not funny at all and of course the funny stuff is fun as well but um i i mean you know to put it in west craven terms the difference between last house and the left decidedly not a fun horror movie no matter its uh exploitation masterpiece status versus nightmare on elm street which is also a, about a child killer, but happens to be very fun, even before Freddie gets too jokey. Um, yeah. 
as as for what you were referencing, James, I think that we would be ignoring our responsibilities if we were doing a Halloween episode that's a grab bag like this and didn't talk about the new Halloween, Halloween Kills. Yeah, I agree. So, which I believe all of us have seen at this point. Yes. Yeah. I actually saw it twice within like a 12 hour period just because I didn't know how I felt about it was after I just watched it, I needed to sort of ruminate. And so I watched it again a few hours later, which I think that kind of tells you a little bit about my feelings on the film, or at least, so let's just go up right in bat and say the film has been very divisive. Yeah. <laughs> it's gotten torn apart on Rotten Tomatoes. Justly or unjustly, it's gotten torn apart on Rotten Tomatoes and um, a lot of fan reception. Let's get into it. Like, let's just get into it. Well, uh, well let's start with Casey. Casey, you saw it, right? Yeah, um, I watched it on Peacock. Didn't make it to the theater on that one. But uh, I don't think it's a good movie. Um, But here's what I do like about it. It actually might be like my favorite kind of version of Michael Myers in that movie. Just because it's so like vicious and kind of relentless in comparison to like the other ones in the series. And I mean... You know, I can see people getting mad because it's kind of actually like the polar opposite of like what Carpenter wanted to do in the first one and like what the producers were telling him, like no blood, you know, like that kind of thing. Because it's the, <laughs> it goes way to the opposite end of the spectrum. It's bloody. It's like some really crazy cool kills. Yeah. But as far as like story wise and like what's happening with the characters, it's just like I, I didn't care. I'm like, anybody can just kind of go at any time it's like i kind of appreciate what they were trying to do like the message they were trying to do with it but like i i don't know it's like i I could see myself watching again just for like the kills factor and like the actual like michael myers stuff but as far as like all the all the surrounding characters like i i'm indifferent on all that i wasn't really into it i i agree with you i wasn't even as as big of a fan as that um but (laughs) uh I, I i did find myself entertained for you know a little over an hour and a half and i agree it, there's some some exciting sequences and it's this is i think it's hands down the goriest we've ever seen michael myers yeah um, yeah and Absolutely. and that's and that's you know there, there's something to be said for that whether that be positive or negative i don't know but first off i find it interesting like i, I kind of almost wish that i could get inside the head of uh david gordon green and ask him what he feels about what he set up as a story. I'm going to try to say this as spoiler free as possible. He set this up as a story and it was filmed. This was supposed to come out last year. Uh, there is a riot sequence in the movie. That, that's as much kind of spoiler as I'll give away on it. And I, I think the trailers do a pretty good job of indicating that's going to happen anyways. Uh, but the meaning of what he filmed last year has a very different meaning being released this year. And some of my problems with the movie, I have to adjust myself um, because I have to realize this was shot before uh, the January 6th riots. So some of the messaging that could have taken place had this movie been shot this year instead of last year, I I can kind of forgive it for for maybe having a bit of a jumbled message. All that being said, though, the, the ending, again, trying to be delicate, I don't want to give away quite what the ending was because... People should see it, Uh, whether you see it on Peacock or see it in the theater. I saw it on Peacock uh, because I want the first experience. I go back to the theater again to not be a sequel. I just felt like it took some of the least interesting aspects of the sequels of Halloween and aimed for a spotlight on direction. Yeah, put a spotlight on them Um, and not just in the sort of like Casey, you and I went and saw the uh, last Halloween together in 2018 which right. I thought did a pretty good job of fan service. Uh, there's a lot of it in there, but it was a lot of like reversal shots and things. And there were you know, like, uh, whereas in 1978, you saw Michael Myers staring through the window. And in 2018, you saw Jamie Lee Curtis staring back through the window, like stuff like that. And I thought that was a lot more clever than like the references they were making in this one. I thought it was a little more blatant and overt. And personally, I don't know if this bothered you guys. I'll, maybe we can talk about it after James has put in his two cents because I know I've gone on for a bit. I really did not like Anthony Michael Hall at all, and I wish he wasn't in this movie. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, okay, that's actually a perfect segue. First off, let me just say I will go. I will say, and I will say it. I've, I said it on social media, and I, I will say it very confidently. It is easily the best looking Halloween film. Like. 
there's shot shot compositions and lighting and just different moments, just visual moments. That's all I'm talking about. There's just visual moments in this that are fucking um, incredible. And I think also all of the flashback sequence that the opening flashback sequence that takes place in 78 is so well done. It looks so much like Carpenter shot it. Even as like Michael, like there's the, when the cop, this is no spoiler, but Cobb is like sort of trying to shoot him as he's down the alleyway and he just sort of slowly turns the corner and the bullet just barely misses him. There just there's an elegance to all of that that I was that I started the movie very confidently. Having said that, part of me wonders if like because it is a middle piece, because it's like book ended by, you know, 2018 Halloween and then Halloween ends, will our perception of the film change once we've seen the full completion? I wondered um, that too. Yeah. I was so but so far as the, my, Anthony Michael Hall, I was so, I was like, oh, that's cool that they're going to do Tommy Doyle. And it's not, you know, it's not Paul Rudd, Tommy Doyle, even though Tommy, you know, Paul Rudd, Tommy Doyle. I love Paul Rudd, but anyway, it's, it's not that whole mess. So I was like, oh, and you know, it's cool to include him because, you know, he is a piece of Halloween mythology and, you know, but just the whole hand, handling of it was so weird. And, you know, everybody's making fun of it online. I didn't bother me as much as it apparently it's bo- bothered the entirety of the fandom, but you know, evil and dies tonight or whatever. Like, yeah, it was a little corny or whatever, but I get that. I was like, it was like people, like the people of Haddonfield trying to like take, you know, to kill this thing. But, you know, I thought the kills were incredible. I thought it, you know, it was very unbelievable at first because, you know, we were at this point, we still just think of Michael Myers as like, he's not a supernatural entity. He's just a man who's so evil that he doesn't subside to pain and all these things. But yeah, it, it, like even the firefighter sequence, which is very well shot and very cool looking and gory and scary. I mean, I was like, oh, this is so like, was he a suit fucking Batman now? But by the end of the movie where they sort of just say like, oh, he is, he's not human anymore or whatever. I was like, well, this is, he, Mike Meyer, until you got to like, I mean, the, the later, first off, the Halloween franchise, honestly, is not good. <laughs> Halloween, <laughs> the original Halloween is fucking great, obviously. It's a classic. It's one of the most pivotal horror films of all time. I love Season of the Witch, but it's not a Michael Myers film, so it's discredited. Part two is meh, but it's easily the best of the rest of them. I do like The Return of Michael Myers. It's fun. Is it a good movie? No, it drags. As f- it drags so bad in the middle third of the movie, it's insane. But by the time you get to the the you know the other ones down the curse of michael myers and all that stuff um it's so bad but carpenter never said like you know he's not is he supernatural he's not you know it was very ambiguous this whole messaging that he you know the more he kills the more deadly he gets it's like part of me likes that and part of me thinks it's goofy and stupid but i'll wait to I'll, i will hold back my opinion until i've seen halloween ends and seen the full trilogy and completion but you know i will say you know david gordon green's got his hands in the exorcist he's doing like three new horror tr- like what it's exorcist i just saw him attached to something else i didn't even know about i could look it up i guess i do have access to the internet anyways but i think a lot of people at first were like oh well, you know not not everybody loved 2018 halloween but most most people at least gave it you know like i think at least a b minus at, at worst but and i think people had more faith in him at that point but i think now i think a lot of people are like oh he's gonna ruin it like the exorcist and he's gonna ruin all these franchises it's like uh. but i mean i know he Bloomhouse is like got him signed up so i don't know we'll see and the, david gordon green's a great director he he makes movies like george washington but then he also makes movies like your highness so i don't know he's he's a he's an interesting dude but anyways <laughs> he is i i like him and i like interviews with him and i i think that he was a good person to take on halloween i don't know if i'll even bother with his exorcist we'll we'll see um i mean if we ever do an episode about it i, I, I will it. i i haven't even like I haven't cared about The Exorcist pretty much ever. Um, I mean, it's the original Exorcist is a great movie. That that's not what I'm trying to imply, but uh, and Exorcist Three is a lot of fun. I was going to say you got. Thank you. I'm glad you yes. said that. <laughs> uh, but you know, I've never held it with quite the same reverence that everyone else does. I have held Halloween at a certain reverence just because the original is such a masterpiece. Um, I think a better film than The Exorcist uh, as a whole. And, and I enjoy the sequel, uh, the first sequel, Halloween Part Two, Part One. And uh, <laughs> uh, what I didn't like about Anthony Michael Hall, honestly, I, I didn't really care much for the character, but I don't think I was supposed to. And there's a part of me, like I debated whether I would even bring it up because it's a little fanboyish. But then I decided, 
David Gordon Green paid such lip service to to the fans on this that I think that it was just such a glaring inconsistency that we didn't have the original Tommy Doyle since we had the original Lindsay Wallace. Um, And as I'm watching it, I know that the reason they've said that they replaced the original Tommy Doyle is because Tommy Doyle's character is supposed to be so big and important. And we're going to, um, like they were going to need basically an actor with better chops than this guy who really hasn't done much since he was a child actor in the original Halloween in 78. Uh, And so I was giving him the credit for that, like as I'm watching the movie and at a certain point, and then certainly by the final point, uh, I was just like, none of that was something that I don't think any actor out of any acting class couldn't have done. There was nothing spectacular about the performance, nothing spectacular about the character. Um, The messaging is muddled because of it, I think being shot prior to january 6th so i do give it the credit for for doing something interesting in that respect uh but yeah i think that the kid that played tommy uh doyle could have played this part just as well as anthony michael hall and anthony michael hall actually made it 10 times more distracting than it that it wasn't the original actor uh because the whole time i'm also trying to imagine him as or trying not to imagine him as john hughes uh, Anthony Michael Hall. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I the role. It's not like the role was like. It's not like he has all this like you know. Imp, I mean, I guess he does the speech. I don't know. I, I don't know. I agree with you, but then also I guess it's I a mini role because he's ham fisted. That's about it. Like it's. <laughs> I will say though, you know, my biggest complaint is tempered because I I also try to use a bit of logic, but you know the fact that Lori Strode was so you know she was basically sidelined for the entirety of the movie. And this really is Lori's story. It's Lori's story just as much as Michael's. But again, knowing that it's the middle part and you want to save that final confrontation for the third one. But I just kept thinking the whole movie, I'm like, why do I, why am I seeing these assholes? Where is fucking Jamie Lee Curtis? Where's Lori Strode? Like, that's who I give a shit about. So to me, I, I, I guess the final thing I'll, I'll say on it is basically if the last Halloween was really kind of like a, a B, B minus kind of movie, the next one has to be Halloween level masterpiece to pull to pull this one up to a D plus um, oh, or, or maybe even a C minus. I'll, I'll be kind and say that the next one could potentially pull this one up to C minus territory. Yeah. And I will say, I don't have as much, I don't have any faith in that, but we'll see. I don't have any faith in it either, <laughs> but I, I'll, I'll watch it. I'll definitely watch it. I, my mind is already made up. I will not see it in the theater. Now, if it's on Peacock, I'll watch it. Um, exactly. whereas this one I was like sitting down to watch it thinking like man I really wish I was like in the theater with a tub of popcorn next one yep, same, yeah, th- exactly this, this series is now a streaming show can I talk about the one stupid thing that put me off about Halloween Kills and it actually it's, yes, there's, a, do. <laughs> there's, a, there's a scene in the actually the original Halloween too who taught Michael Myers how to drive <laughs> <laughs> wasn't he in prison when he was like six years old well, he was doing a very good job last night. And also, and also, it's like, did Loomis teach him how to drive? And if so, can we see that movie? No, well, because Loomis was surprised he could drive too. I, I don't know. They try. Rob Zombie tried to answer that. Um, oh yeah, I actually, I've I've never seen the zombie one. So yeah. I'm going to go on record as saying, despite universal opinion, the I hate the first one. But the second one is so so ridiculous and so Rob Zombified that I actually enjoy it as a giant fuck you to all the people who hated this first one. But <laughs> but let's give let's give Halloween Kills the one bit of like thumbs up for me at least is that immaculate recreation through makeup of fucking of Loomis. Like and it, and it hardly took any makeup either. I've heard. Yeah, the, the actor looked very. He was very close to it, but I mean, there was still definitely makeup involved and stuff and costuming and stuff. But when they first showed the thing, I was like, is that digital? Because if that's digital, that looks really good. And then I found out later it was all makeup. So, and, and you know, I'm glad you said something about that because I do want to agree with you that that first bit that's uh, recapping, you know, I, I'm just going to assume everybody's seen the first Halloween here and that we don't see Michael captured in, in the original Halloween. Yeah. I think that him going back and and giving us the time period from when he got up in from from the you know from the yep. lawn in front of the house to when he actually gets arrested, I thought that was really cool. And I liked the fact that when 
um, when Green directs the scene where they there's the cops are surrounding Michael on that first night in 78, they use they replicate the shot of when Michael is first apprehended as a child in Carpenter's Halloween. Yes. Like him standing exactly. in the same 100%. spot in front of the house with uh people coming up and realizing what he's done. I, I actually did like that. And I think it was kind of the quality of the first act really did make me dislike it what gave me false next. hope. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it gave me false. I was like, really, like, you know, 10 minutes into it, I was like, this is going to be fantastic. And then, you know, evil dice in the night, you know, was repeated for a million <laughs> times. And I was like, I can't anymore. Franchise dies tonight. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah, pretty much. But yeah, it's like, what is, what is this, like, number 11 of a Halloween film? It, it, I mean, it's hard to, like, be like, I don't know why this wasn't as good as like the original at this point. It's like, how is the 11th of fucking anything going to be as good as like, because they hyped it so much. And I, I will always hype it. That's their fucking job. (laughs) True. I I think, I just think because the message of like, we're going to do a, you know, fuck everything after the Carpenter version. And this will be like, you know, you just get your hopes up. But again, I I love David Gordon. David Gordon Green has proven that he is a very talented director. And there's a lot of films of his I really enjoy, but he is not perfect. And, you know, I, I, I think this definitely wasn't one of his successes. But again, I, I will I will hold final judgment until I've watched the uh, full trilogy in its entirety. And that, and then I will try to see it as one big piece. So, yeah, I'll, I'll definitely see it the way that I expressed it to my wife uh, when she I mean, she doesn't really care about horror movies anyways. But I told her I saw Halloween Kills and she she asked, how was it? And I said, not as good as the last one, but probably better than the seven before that. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty dead on, actually. <laughs> That's dead on, yep. Uh, let's go ahead and get into uh, some of the films that are not Halloween that are fun to watch on Halloween. As, as James had said, this is a uh, fun size grab bag of Halloween movies. And, and inevitably, a Halloween movie from the Halloween franchise is always going to inevitably sneak in there somewhere. <laughs> but, yeah i mean if most people are being honest if you're a real i'd say the majority of people who either consider themselves film fans or specifically horror film fans if halloween isn't in your top five favorite horror movies to watch in halloween or just even movies to watch in halloween you're probably lying um <laughs> or you know pretentious but um <laughs> but i mean i think halloween movies for each of us like certain things are going to impact people differently either what age they were when they first saw the movie or if they saw the film itself for the first time on halloween or in that season for me the films that i chose to talk about the specifically films that i have to watch every halloween to me they sum up the holiday because i watch scary movies all year long it's not just i don't want to just watch any horror movie on halloween even though the whole month i practically pretty much do but come halloween i want to watch movies specifically that for me capture that flavor and there are movies i watch during halloween that aren't scary movies like the worst witch and certain films that are halloween specific but aren't necessarily scary movies but in the vein of horror movies that i watch on halloween like i said i have very specific tastes and some of them i'm sure universally would show up universally on lists well let's let's do this since casey is our guest casey do you want to talk about a movie you know just any movie that you have to watch every halloween yeah, like I put together a list. And I'm trying to go through the list and try to highlight one that I definitely have to do like every year. Um, I definitely agree with you. You kind of have to watch the first Halloween every year. You yeah. Know, just it's kind of like the ultimate horror movie about the yeah. season and about the holiday. Um, it's it's I will like doing Christmas without ever playing Jingle Bells. You know, it's right. Yeah, yeah it's just kind of like hand in hand. Um, I will say really quick about I know we're trying to get away from Halloween, but uh, Halloween three season of the witch probably in the past, like five or six years though, is definitely become one that I try to watch every Halloween season. Like, absolutely. If I'm, if I'm truly honest with myself as amazing as the original Halloween is, I think Halloween three might actually be my favorite Halloween movie. Um, I think I'm, I, I I don't know if it beats the original Halloween, but, I it's love just it fun to watch. It's just the yeah. most fun. Like, yeah, it's absolutely. It's weird. Like, it's, it's just, pre- super, just it's super. Weird. It's super eighties. It's like 
the story is weird the like you know they don't pull punches when it comes to like hurting kids like, yeah <laughs> it's just it's just so bizarre and like fascinating and like carpenter and alan howarth's their howarth's the score is great yeah. yeah it's just a really cool fun 80s horror film and and i really enjoy watching that pretty frequently now um, and it, it cements tom atkins is the baddest dude ever yeah, yeah like atkins is always great i was just gonna um, say uh you know this was kind of the uh the only era where a, a guy like tom atkins could be you know the guy who <laughs> the guy who lands the girl halfway through the movie you know <laughs> yeah <laughs> right <laughs> it's uh, way out of his league yeah I, I, he's he's he seems to be like an alcoholic with some anger issues, but like he's still <laughs> gonna, you know, be the the sex symbol of the movie, which is very early eighties. And I and and Atkins yeah. has a Tom Atkins has a great sense of humor about him in, himself. Casey, you and I went and saw Tom Atkins live. Uh, it was the last big thing I did before the pandemic hit. Yeah, there was a triple feature at Beyond Fest in Los Angeles at the Egyptian Theater, and it was uh, Tom Atkins Fest, and so it was Halloween three. Uh, night of the creeps in the fog yeah i was gonna say yeah of course it is (laughs) yeah and it was great and he was there and it was really cool they gave us all like paper tom atkins masks and stuff (laughs) it was a great day that was fun it was and he's so fun like he yeah he's he's a crap i told uh i i've had the luxury of meeting him I've, i've got a few things signed by him and i remember uh this year going to uh texas frightmare like I was like, man, like if you guys have a chance to meet, there was a we basically took a shuttle, and there's a bunch of people on there. I'm like, if you guys have never met Tom Atkins, you have to take the opportunity to meet Tom Atkins. And what was funny was when I met him at I think the the second time I met him, I think both times I met him were at Monster Palooza or Son of Monster Palooza. But the first time I met him, he had a good line, but you know, it was maybe like four or five people in front of me, and then some people joined behind me. But this year at, at Texas Frightmare, it literally was three fourths of the entire building. The line. It, had to have been like a hundred people in line to meet him, which blew my mind and made me really happy. But he's a crack up, but he's a really funny guy. Uh, he still is very, he will definitely flirt with ladies. If there's a pretty <laughs> girl there, he will definitely still flirt with them. So he's <laughs> not lost a step, but, but yeah, Casey, that was that, that, that movie I assumed was going to get brought up tonight. Cause I know we are all three big fans of that. And again, it's sort of, it really is. It's a distillation of, what is fun about Halloween specifically and, you know, making the masks be such a part of it and, you know, the costumes, which is such a big part of the holiday and making it, you know, evil Halloween masks. And so it's just incredible. So great. Yeah, it's, it's definitely getting a fan base now because there's way more merchandising for it, like within the yeah. past, like two years than there ever was before. Yeah. It, it, I mean, for the longest time, it was reviled because it had the audacity to not be a Michael Myers film. Because, you know, they wanted to step away from Michael Myers and turn it into like an anthology every year. It's a different Halloween movie, which I still think would have been the much better idea. But fans being fans, crybabies being crybabies and, you know, the people. And this was in the 80s. This is well before the Internet and, uh, you know, nerd rage online. So, but right. yeah, it's unfortunate. But in the last few years, people have finally started to come around that it separated from the Michael Myers film just enjoy it on its own and it's a fucking great movie. All right. Uh so James, why don't you um take take the next uh fun size bar here and, and... all right. <laughs> so my number one choice that's not movies we've already talked about basically is uh 1986's Night of the Demon. I wonder that's if this is gonna come about... up tonight. <laughs> <laughs> it's just the perfect 80s horror movie. It's still Besides being like one of the best 80s horror movies or or best uh, Halloween films for me, it's just I think it's such a quintessential 1980s horror movie. Everything about it is memorable. It's goofy and silly, but, you know, genuinely really kind of creepy and atmospheric. And the you know, the, from the little bro- first off, start off with bodacious booby sis and <laughs> sun dried poodle turd and all of the little brothers smart ass com- i mean the whole bodacious boobies thing is so hard to process these days like it's such an inappropriate scene but but then you know judy who's the main actress see, like who i you know i 
I think she was only really did television and a few other things. I think she was mainly known for Dallas, but she was to me, to me, she is the quintessential eighties horror ingenue. Like I think she's so adorable. I think she's such a like wholesome character. I, I she's one of my all-time favorite like sort of hero film heroines, and she nobody ever talked about. I don't think she I mean she wasn't, you know, she didn't have the gravitas or the, you know, like of a Jamie Lee Curtis or she unlike Linnea Quigley, who's also in this film, she didn't have that kind of personality, but I just thought she was so adorable and so perfect for this sort of like wholesome good girl role. Um, I love Stooge. Um, obviously, <laughs> Linnea Quigley is Suzanne in it and the whole opening, that whole scene where, you know, do you guys have sour balls? Uh, that's too bad. You mustn't get a lot of blowjobs. Like that whole thing. And, you know, Angela is such a great villain character. I didn't know until recently that, she was inducted into the horror hall of fame because she was the first female first lead female monster in a horror movie, which I'm like, there's been she, but apparently she's in the true. horror hall of fame for that. And I didn't know that she, uh, it's, it's on the internet. I don't know if it's true. I don't know how much. Well, you if, can look if, it up. if the internet says then it must be true, but uh, exactly. I think that Barbara Steele that. might have something to say about that. Or okay, and then, it's like going back to the thirties and the forties, but <laughs> yeah. um but yeah, anyways, but um, the whole cast is great. Well, the, I think the one weak spot is that some characters like Stooge, obviously, and and Sal, who's you know, you know, the people, the people who were there, they, the people who were bad are so broadly bad that like it feels stylistic rather than inept. Yeah, and and <laughs> but again, they're I think they're so memorable, and, and that's the thing. So many, so much of the opening that um, the title sequence, that animated title sequence. That is one of my favorite. That is that is Halloween to me. If I close my eyes and I think of Halloween, that is going to come into my head. It's so perfect. The you know the music, all that like the sort of eighties punk and post punk and new wave like is so good in it. It's genuinely like I said, it's really creepy. There's the whole boob lipstick thing. That's I remember seeing that in junior high and I couldn't. It was so weird to me. I didn't know what the fuck was happening and it was like because as a little kid, it's like a booby. That's hot. oh, what's happening? Like. Why are you doing this to Booby? It's just so weird. Um, <laughs> the monster makeup is great. I, the monster makeup's iconic. Yeah, absolutely. So, yeah, to me, it's just, it's so fun. And it, it's so, ev there's every five minutes, there's something that is so memorable or so weird or just so over the top that it just works from start to finish. And uh, it just, I, to me, it's like the perfect, like, eat candy and watch a horror movie moment or uh, horror movie movie. That's redundant. But anyways. I agree. It's it is a good like popcorn and candy movie. Um, I, I will fully admit I didn't see it until I was in my early twenties, and my idea from the video box growing up with uh, what was your name Angela is on the the Angela, cover. Yep. Yeah, the the demon uh, and uh, that's in Angela or wh whatever you want to call it, however you want to define that. Uh, the imagery of it, the make it of it on the VHS cover for years, I thought it was an, an Italian horror movie. I thought it was like, uh, you know, like a Bava Argento but, yeah, type Mario thing, Bava you know. Movie, yeah. uh, and well, I mean, it definitely, I mean, the Demons movies, it has a similar aesthetic. Um, yeah. the, the, the teeth, but yeah, I could definitely see that. I must have mixed yeah, them thought, up as uh, a kid, but when I saw it as an adult, I'm putting on Night of the Demons, expecting to have you know that uh, that sort of goblin soundtrack it's sort of atmosphere. start, and, and yeah, and it starts with that great animated opener, and I'm like, this, I think this movie is different than what I always thought it was. Yeah, <laughs> I, didn't expect I mean, to me, it's like it's so it's an MTV generation horror movie. Yes, like it's. Yeah, it's like a music video full yeah, like definitely. Long. What about you, Devin? What's a horror movie that you have to watch every single year? Uh well, for me, I, I don't know. I almost felt like uh by picking this, I'm almost stating the obvious, but it, it's aside from the thing, uh is probably my favorite horror movie of all time, and that is Evil Dead 2. So yeah, that's that's, a, that's definitely on my list for sure. Yeah, that's a that's a that's a must. Yeah. Uh, it was something I did see when I was young. Um, I, I mean, I wasn't I wasn't up on it as they were released. I was a little too young to be watching it at the time. Uh, but I certainly saw Evil Dead one and two before Army of Darkness came out, so I was able to get hyped for Army of Darkness. And uh, there's a lot of. I have people... a funny story for that. Can I tell a funny story for that? Yes, please do. So I 
again, I still remember, I might have told the story on this podcast before. I remember me and my twin brother being in a video rental store in Ukiah, California. And we were, because, you know, that me and Joe are my twin brother. That's, you know, if we were, my parents let us every weekend choose a movie to rent. Most of the time it was horror or action. But we were like browsing the horror section, this old, this older, not old. I mean, he seemed older to us. He's probably in his 20s or 30s. But this old, like, stoner, metalhead guy, mullet, the whole deal was like, was like, have you guys seen, we were like, so you guys trying to find something good to watch? And we're like, yeah, like, have you seen Evil Dead 2 yet? And I'll never forget it. It was so, it's like, <laughs> we left and we're like, we have to see this movie. So but I still remember junior high school, I'm in class, in like a math class or something. And this this kid comes in, and he drops a box, like a, a box at the front of the class of book, by, of, of a book, rat, what is it? Like book covers. Remember when you used to like cover your books in school to keep them from getting damaged? Yeah. But they were all Army of Darkness book covers. The movie was just coming out. Somehow my junior high, the junior, more junior high, I went to this California, got a box of these things. And I remember one freaking out. They didn't know it existed at that point. But I also remember the entire year I had two books covered in Army of Darkness book wrap, <laughs> book covers. So. I'm, and I regret not grabbing like a stack of them and holding on to them. Anyways, yeah, for some reason, like Universal was big on like making book like school book covers for like what is films is promoting. Because I still have actually some like original '84 like Lynch Dune ones that I got. Oh, as a oh kid. shit! Yeah, I remember them for whatever reason in school. Like they would have random ass like do uh, book covers for random ass movies that were coming out that they did. So that's, that's crazy that they were still doing that up to like 93 or 92 or yeah. whatever. It's so I funny. Too. Not keeping it. It, it's funny because it's definitely a rated R movie and they're marketing it to school kids. Uh, but, but I've always, yeah. I've always felt that army of darkness should have been a PG 13 anyways. Um, like it's yeah. probably one F word away from being a PG 13. Uh, but th- I think that's really where it's audience begins i'll say uh, i won't say belongs because i think yeah or, i think the evil dead movies are for everybody that likes uh you know fun and blood and guts uh but but evil dead 2 is really where it started the the first evil dead certainly had a sense of humor and it's a fun horror movie evil dead 2 had the audacity to be a funny horror movie yeah it was definitely that that kind of era anyways you know which gave us night of the demons night of the creeps um the reanimator a lot of these things were kind of being set up around the same time and certainly were not influencing one another let's say but evil dead 2 there's something special about it and i there's really kind of two things special about it. one thing special is sam raimi and the other thing that we all know is special about evil dead 2 is bruce campbell uh Anybody that could cut his own hand yeah. off with a chainsaw and have you cracking up at the same time, uh, it's yeah, like yeah. that that's it's, a special talent. <laughs> it's brilliant. Like Evil, Evil Dead 2 has this like special place in my heart for me. One, because it was one of the earliest horror films I remember like watching. Like I was in the movies like pretty young, but like it wasn't, it was, I was probably like nine or 10 before like I really was able to like start getting into horror. And it was because I was watching it at like a neighbor's house and not my own because my parents weren't in, like wouldn't want us to watch that shit. So uh, I had a, a neighbor, a friend of mine I went to school with, and uh, him and his older brother, they would rent horror films. And so like we'd go to their place after school and watch them. And so, like, the earliest I remember was, like, 1987. And so it was, like, Evil Dead 2 was one, uh, Monster Squad, even though that's kind of, like, PG-13, and stuff like that. And, like, Evil Dead 2 was so over the top and so gory. And so for that to be, like, one of the first, like, horror, like, you know, nitty-gritty horror films to, like, see, you're just, like, holy shit, what is this movie? And like, Yeah, it's pretty hardcore. It was fascinating, and it was, it was awesome. And it was just, like... And yeah, because and because Bruce Campbell's so funny in it, and like you know, Ash is kind of like a goddamn clown, basically. <laughs> like that balance was great as as far as like being young and being exposed to it. I mean, obviously, it's not a movie for kids, but like if yeah, you know, you're gonna if you're gonna be like you know pretty liberal about horror films that your kids are gonna see, like 
as intense as it is, it's also super funny. And it's not like, I don't know if it'd be the worst idea to be like, you don't know what a horror movie is. Here you go. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, yeah. I think it holds, I think it holds that, that, that distinction of being, I mean, first of it, it, you know, they say it invented a genre, this, this, the splatter punk genre, like the splat stick, splat stick, yeah. Yeah. Splat stick you know, and, and, and rightfully so, but yeah, it's, yeah, it's, it's, it is one of those movies that I think I've, I don't think I've ever met a single person who does like, even if they're just remotely into film or remotely into like horror movies or whatever, I don't think I've ever met anybody who's not a fan of Evil Dead 2. One of the rare films that is like I, in my life, I've never run across anybody. I'm sure there's dudes online right now shitting all over it, but in my personal life, I've never met anybody when I brought up Evil Dead 2 that wasn't super stoked on it. So, yeah, I mean, I mean, as far as like, opinions of film go is like it's taken me many years to be like you know what people are into what they're into they're gonna exactly. have different opinions but if i came across someone who was like evil dead 2 is a piece of shit i would fucking like you turn and like walk out of the fucking area <laughs> yeah. i'd be like i i got no use for you dude you yeah. you know best have a nice life best of luck 100 but you I, don't, know? I don't know how far you're gonna get not thinking evil dead 2 is a fucking great movie exactly it's one of those movies where it kind of alters what i think of your opinion of movies if you don't like evil dead 2 like oh okay well you're probably a decent person but please don't talk to me about movies ever um yeah. <laughs> uh, but I, I, I appreciate I, your humanitarian efforts <laughs> but <laughs> as far as movies go you could just fuck right off <laughs> yeah exactly um but this actually reminds me of something this is actually a, a really fond memory of mine from 1994 i was going to the theater to see natural born killers and then i was going to um like I, my dad dropped me off that day i was gonna go out and, and get a ticket uh, i did not theater hop just gonna say uh to see true lies after natural born killers and i was going from one theater to the other and this usher goes hey dude nice shirt uh and i looked down i'm wearing my evil dead 2 t-shirt and it was the first time i ever met this guy and uh this guy's name is casey o'connor <laughs> that's right yeah. our relationship I started do. with evil dead 2 now that i think about that's it that's right that's great <laughs> i i as I've heard that story so many times, and I, I, I'll be damned. I totally forgot. Like, <laughs> wow, that was so, Devin. Before we ever met, I remember you walking across campus. You had like an army jacket on and an Evil Dead t shirt, and I think that was what I was like, <laughs> Casey might have been there. I'm pretty sure you would have been there, but I remember my brother, twin brother, and my friend Harat was there, and I remember you walked by, and I was like, "Who's this hot shot?" think he is in his evil dead two shit <laughs> and i was like <laughs> and i remember being like i want to know this kid but you were younger than that you were a, you know you had the audacity to be in lower you were, like, we're the only geeks lower. around here that are into this shit what the fuck's exactly. going on but, <laughs> but i remember is knowing of you long before we met because i was like this kid knows what's up so um but uh, uh that that shirt made me a lot of friends apparently <laughs> Yeah, see, Evil Dead 2 is the great unifier, people. Get on exactly. it. <laughs> I would say one of the greatest purchases I ever made, but it was 1994, right, so I'd have to say it's one of the greatest purchases my mom ever made. There you go. <laughs> but, uh, uh, Casey, do you have any other Halloween essentials? Oh, I have plenty. Um, most of the stuff is, I think, stuff that wouldn't be surprising is kind of stuff I think most people would lend towards to. I'm trying to think of ones that are like, are probably not popular the one i can think of that's on my list that i think is kind of odd and maybe not known too much is a movie called popcorn oh yeah Bloody. popcorn um I popcorn about that one is, in a while <laughs> i i'm a sucker for like the subgenre of horror movies where it's like shit goes down in a movie theater yeah um, same and so uh popcorn is one of the these movies and it's a really good one of these films and it's really weird because it was this movie that I guess for budget and tax reasons was shot in Jamaica, even though it's supposed to take place in like little town America. Yeah. I, so I didn't like, know that. So that <laughs> aspect that is kind of interesting. Yeah. I mean, uh, Synapse Films, uh, if you're interested in this movie, they have uh, a disc of it that's really great and it's really 
got in depth with uh, yeah. you know special features and whatnot. But yeah, it's just this weird little fun movie that came out like in 1990, and uh, no one really talks about too much. I mean, I guess like you know super horror fans probably do, but yeah. So it's like you know it's a it takes place in a movie theater. There's a horror fest. There's people there, but then like there's this killer going around in the theater. And like, it's, it's just really fun. Not too many well-known people. There's character actors. You're like, oh, it's that, that guy. Uh, but, uh, you know, no one else could be like, oh, he's in it. Like, let the, I got to check it out. <laughs> <laughs> but it's just a fun premise and it's a fun movie. And I, I kind of recommend that as far as like movies you may not hear people talk about that, you know, or is, it's extremely rewatchable for me anyway. And then as far as uh, that same genre, I definitely got to, give props to demons as well yes as far as uh shit going down in a movie theater <laughs> that that one it might even be better than popcorn but they kind of go hand in hand and like that's that's a great double feature by the way if if you want to get that going i love it and i have to point out that the villain in the movie the the the, the antagonist is played by tom villard who was one of the two stork brothers he was the stork brother that one, one crazy summer at Goldweight in the fucking in uh, one crazy summer, and I remember watching the movie and me like it took me a second. I was like, "What the shit?" Wait, the Stork like, Brothers? Like, <laughs> Stork Brothers, the villain in this movie? He's like the monster, but yeah, it's 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 such a fun movie, and yeah, like weirdly, really not well known, but also Casey nailed it. It is a great double feature to Demons. I have actually done watch that before, so yeah, like. So if someone in if one of these repertory theaters in LA where I'm at programs that like I I will do my damnedest to be there because that's I know that's going to be awesome. That's good shit right there, brother. Absolutely. So yeah, add those to your list if you haven't seen them or love it. Possible rewatchable. They're definitely all rewatchable. I haven't seen those in so long that I'm definitely going to watch them this Halloween. Yeah, man, do yeah. that double feature. You'll have fun. You know, I, I like the first like Demons One and Demons Two, and there's the 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 history of demon sequel gets real confusing because of Italy and their right. whole shit. rights and issues and exactly <laughs> renaming things. And, but the first two demon movies are yeah, great. They're, but the, they're first, fantastic. The, the first demon movie is my top three. Like it's, it's one of the truly like, you know, I, it gets me every time. And I'm like, Casey, I, I love films that are one take place in a movie theater. But I also love films that where basically the all the protagonists are trapped somewhere and they can't get out. You know, demon. Yeah. You know, the church where they're trapped in the church. This movie, Demon Seed, which has become some weird favorite of mine in the last few years. From Dust um, Till Dawn, it's kind of like that. Yeah. yeah. So I love that. I love that concept. But yeah, uh, for sure. So for my other choice. It's coincidental because today is its actual 35th anniversary of its of its premiere date, uh, and that is the 1986 version of the movie. the The movie Trick or Treat, not Trick or Treat, Trick or Treat. Metal Trick or Treat. The heavy metal, the 80s heavy metal Trick or Treat, <laughs> uh, starring uh, Skippy from Family Ties, which is still, <laughs> you know, I remember he's Mark Price who played Skippy and, and, and who's the, the star of this movie, he was so perfect for this role of being this sort of fucking... Because all the people like, you know, people like, oh, heavy metal kids are these tough, like, you know, like juvenile delinquents and stuff. Most of... In, in reality, most heavy metal fans, specifically this time, were sort of weird Dungeon Dragon kids that were just sort of loners and, you know, hate... Like, they, they weren't dangerous or cool. They were fucking nerds. And Skippy played it to the T. But it's just so fun. You've got like, you've got Ozzy Osbourne has, ex in fact, the movie notoriously for a long time when it was released on DVD, like it was so misleading because on the cover you had Ozzy Osbourne and uh, uh, um, Gene the Simmons. worst, yeah, the worst human being on, our, on the planet. Uh, <laughs> Gene Simmons, uh, who Gene Simmons actually is good in the movie. He plays this, he, he's actually got kind of a vital role where he plays this rock DJ. You know, they they were like front and center, but they're both like Ozzy Osbourne has one cameo. He's basically playing this like preacher who hates heavy metal. You know, playing off the joke of that. But um, stars. It's basically for those of you who've seen it. It's basically like famous me metal musician kills himself, and then his record is going to 
bring the end of the world and he's a demon now. It's real goofy, stupid shit. There's some really ridiculous moments in this movie, but uh, Sammy Kerr, but it's, it's so fun. And again, it takes place on Halloween, which is, you know, sort of, I can't help it. If it takes place on Halloween or has Halloween like iconography in it, I, I just, you know, it's going to make the list anyways. But I've loved, I mean, there's a whole subgenre of heavy metal horror movies, Black Roses, Rock and Roll Nightmare, uh, Hard Rock Zombies. I mean, there's so many, but. Rockstar with think... Mark Wahlberg. What's up? <laughs> Rockstar with Mark Wahlberg. That's right, exactly. That's, that's uh, maybe Stone the most Blood. frightening of all. <laughs> Sorry. But uh, Hack and uh, uh, Hack a Latin, that's another good one. But, anyways, um, but it's just so fun. It's like, it's such a, it's really actually weirdly has a real heart to it and like it's not just it, it's trying to be something more than just you know uh it's trying to see something about culture and people and you know loners and you know whatever but it, it it's it's it doesn't succeed but it's trying but it's the soundtrack is great uh the the um i'm blanking on the name i think the guy who plays the villain sammy kern i think he was like a, a dancer or something but he's actually so great in the role he's so magnetic and really believable as this like sort of kind of post Alice Cooper sort of satanic, you know, uh, uh, heavy metal rock star. He's really good and really like, it's genuinely like a really good performance from this kind of, I think, non-actor didn't really do much as far as I know. I mean, I could be wrong, but I could have always done research, but, but, but yeah, it's, it's to me, it's just, I, I love it. It's so, it's much like Night of the Demons. It's like, I want to just eat Snickers and watch it like on Halloween. That's just, you know, it's got that vibe for me. I, I got to admit, I have not seen it yet. And it's one I've been wanting to watch for like the past couple of years and I haven't got around to. So now that now that you're talking about it, I think I'm going to put that on my list for this month for sure. It's good shit. There's an evil. Uh, uh, well, no, I won't. No spoilers. Anyways, what about you, Devin? I'm going to go backwards a little bit. It's I'm not going to go all the way back to the Universal era, um, but there was a 70s character who is definitely iconic that doesn't get talked about quite as much. And I'm going to specifically say the original, although there is a sequel and it can be a double feature and it's very satisfying to do it that way. And that's the great Vincent Price in the abominable Dr. Fives. I watch that every <laughs> Halloween. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's really inventive. It's, it's uh, it has like a kill count sort of vibe, like, like would come with the later slasher movies even though it's not quite a slasher movie, it's, it's this weird, almost like mix of like Agatha Christie meets slasher movie uh, because we all know who's doing it, but there is a whodunit element of it. There's a police inspector yeah. element of it. Uh, Vincent Price plays Dr. Fibes in one of his own personal favorite roles that he's ever played. And uh, it, it's a little weird. It's a little off from what you would normally get in a Vincent Price movie because he actually doesn't speak in the movie, but he has a lot of dialogue. Um, <laughs> uh, the reason for this is, is uh, there's a backstory to Dr. Fibes. You're, you're meeting Dr. Fibes at a very interesting time in his life where everyone thinks that he's dead and everyone has thought he's dead for decades. He was a doctor of theology and music, as if that's a thing, in, in England. <laughs> Um, you get the idea that maybe this movie takes place in the twenties. So his, his heyday, Dr. Fibes' heyday may have been kind of turn of the century, 20th century sort of time period. He's got a big enough name that people are finding like uh, poster bills for Dr. Anton Fibes and his clockwork wizards in the movie when they're doing, when they're uh, investigating the deaths. Uh, but he is in a horrible car accident with his wife and he's pronounced dead. And his wife is rushed to uh, the local hospital where Joseph Cotton leads a group of surgeons operating on her and trying to save her life, uh, which they ultimately do not succeed. And um, what? Oh, why? Why can't I remember her name? Mrs. Fibes. Uh, oh, it's going to bother me. I'm not going to remember <laughs> Dr. Fibes' wife's name. Um, Victoria. Victoria Fibes. Victoria Fibes is pronounced dead. Little do they know that. Dr. Fibes actually did survive the crash. He's gone underground and he's built this whole elaborate underground fortress where he's been planning revenge against the doctors who could not save his beloved Victoria on the operating table. 
you find it's pretty convoluted. You find out they had a chauffeur and that's who everyone thought Dr. Fives' body was. So nobody thinks Dr. Fives is alive. And when these doctors start dying in really elaborate methods that uh, are, are meant to symbolically represent the plagues on the pharaohs out of the Bible. Remember, he's a doctor of theology. Um, <laughs> Uh, there are really no, there's nothing pointing back to Doctor Fives initially, and they have to investigate and find which cases in the hospital have involved all nine of these same surgeons working as a team. And uh, it takes the cops and the top surgeon working together to kind of try to figure out who this is, and then ultimately it falls on uh, the cops are rather inept in this movie, and and the lead surgeon played by Joseph Cotton has to kind of take on Doctor Fives. Oh, and the reason why uh, he has a lot of dialogue, despite the fact that he never speaks, is because Dr. Fives was injured in the car crash and using his technical genius of acoustics, this little, this is almost what they call it in the movie, <laughs> he's able to fashion a way that he can hook a jack into his throat and project his voice using you know, those old uh, phonograph speakers, you know, the, the big uh, sort of cone ones from the wind yeah. up. Uh, yeah. It, it's just, it's so just oozing with style. They're constantly weaking at the audience. They know exactly yeah. what kind of movie they're making predates the slashers, but fits right in with them with the elaborate kills. Very funny movie, but also very spooky and atmospheric and Vincent Price at his best. I, I'm assuming you guys have seen, Dr. Fives. Yes. yes. Uh, I actually just watched it for the first time last year, actually. Oh, right on. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I got those uh, those Vincent Price collections, those three volumes that uh, Shout Factory put out. Those are um, great. Yeah. Like, I mean, I, I still have to go through all of them, but I oh, think shit, I'm, I didn't grab that. I yeah. think I'm going to probably like at least do one Vincent Price movie a year from here on out till I get through, through those. Um, yeah, it's it's completely original. It's like different than like you know anything else you you can see. And yeah, Vincent Price is so like performance is so entertaining. Uh, the concept is like weird and like the visual style of the film is great. Like it's it's a fantastic film. It's definitely rewatchable. I could I could totally understand why someone watch that every year. Yeah, I mean it's it's so its own thing. It's so uncomparable to anything. First of the the five space, you know, no spoilers, but you know, like it's so weird and and again, like the 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 audio jack and the throw, it's just visually, it's really interesting. All of the weird set pieces are really interesting, and like his whole, like you said, his whole fortress thing is so, it's so it's so seventies, <laughs> and it's so like weird. And to me, it's there's actually a lot of similarities. I didn't even think about it until you we've been talking to, um, like fam of the paradise. Uh, I mean, oh yeah you're thing. right but I, I can see that yeah it's you know just to tonally even just where it's like you can tell vincent price is having a ton of fun with it like he knows he's getting to really revel in the tone of it and he's and the character the Adom abominable you know dr fives fives himself is such a great anti-hero villain like is he i mean he's a I, yeah it's just, kind of rooting for him even though yes, I, yeah yes, absolutely yeah <laughs> Which Absolutely. was not a common thing for horror movies at that time. No. I mean, you, you didn't start really rooting for the bad guys until the proper slashers like, uh, you know, Jason, Freddy, Chucky. Well, I'm, I'm blanking on the title of it, but it's uh, the Vincent Price movie where he basically plays like a failed actor who people also think commits suicide. Theater and of Blood. Theater of Blood. Similar to that where, I mean, again, it's all stylized and all the, the the killings are themed but you know it's themed around shakespeare you know plays you and know the camp levels off the charts in theater of, and i love theater of blood too I, that's a good yeah. thing that the camp is off the charts i agree 100 I, I think they're both like and then throw madhouse in there and that's a good triple feature but yeah i mean yeah. you can't go wrong you you're not going to go wrong watching a vincent price movie on halloween anyway so yeah. if you're gonna watch one though at donald abominable dr fives yeah top top tier Mask of the Red Death, I I watched last year too. That's fantastic. That's great too. That and was one almost my... my pick. That was it was between Mask of the Red Death and the Abominable Doctor Fives, and I went with Did Dr. Corman Fives. direct? 
Mask of the Red Death? Yes, he did. Yeah, yeah, dude. That's yeah. It's what a great movie, dude. I need to rewatch it. I own it, but I don't. I haven't watched it in probably since I bought it. But it's a good ass movie. Yeah, that's it's in that, forever, bro. That's in that Vincent Price collection too. I don't know if you guys remember my my first apartment. I had the Doctor Fives one sheet on my wall. Oh, I remember. Of, yeah, one of my favorite taglines: "Love means never having to say you're ugly." ugly. Yep. <laughs> yeah, no, that, post, that poster is amazing. Yeah, one hundred percent. I still, I so as soon as you said that, I literally pictured your old apartment. I know it like transported me back to that apartment. <laughs> I helped you build that kitchen table. Remember? The- yes, yes, you did, and the futon. That's right. Yep, I did. <laughs> anyway. um, but anyways, uh, yeah, a great choice. I'm actually now that you said that, I actually now regret not putting a uh, Vincent Price movie on my list because now I feel like I've done myself a disservice. But there's I'm too much. There's too much great horror, man. Like my list yeah, is crazy totally. long. It's honestly like i like to mix it up like halloween it's like yeah there's the ones i have to do every year but also i'm it's also a time where i'm trying to find stuff that i haven't oh yeah like yeah, old, old or new like there's so much old great horror that like i have not seen that like i'm still and that's kind of what's great it's like i could still watch movies that have been around forever and like it's gonna be like some fresh thing to me so likewise definitely that's a thing that's why i love halloween season is that you get to you know there's just it's it, all three of us are our physical media collectors. Like we buy physical media and we have physical media libraries, but you know, even if just, you know, you may not own a film and if you're going to, there's a horror movie you might not have seen yet. It's probably going to be streaming around this time. So the availability and stuff. And again, there's always new stuff coming out. And uh, I try to, uh, I try to mix old favorites with like, like you said, Casey, like still like exploring, like, cause there's still going to be stuff I haven't seen and, you know, try to give new things a chance as well yeah there's so many boutique labels that are putting out like such random like movies that like i've never heard of and like they existed at a time when like i've been alive and you're just like how have i never heard of this like this crazy ass movie you know and so exactly and so yeah you go like let's go see what this is about and so it's it's fun yeah i i've been very impressed with some of these labels uh you know there's vinegar syndrome there's um i mean shout factory Severed Films is good too. Severin, yeah. Severin Arrow has been putting out a ton of stuff. Synapse. Syn- yeah. That's the one I was trying to think of. Synapse, yes. And uh Shout Factory too, or Scream Factory, but Scream Factory has really been kind of doing a lot of the the tried and true cult classics, whereas like yeah. Vinegar Syndrome and Synapse uh, have been no, I- really putting out stuff that was like originally made for video or yeah um like on video like movies that were made on vhs and giving them kind of of a a new exposure that one of my all-time favorite movies uh sledgehammer which i seem to be (laughs) in the minority in loving that movie and and all david a Pryor movies yeah it's you know and that's the thing severin and stuff taking a chance on doing that and the thing is some i mean honestly it's going to be hit and miss especially i mean vinegar syndrome puts out the best looking yeah but the movies aren't always great but no, I mean, the, but in a way, it's very authentic to the time. You'd go into a, a video rental store and the box art would be amazing. And then you get it home, like, you know, right. microwave massacre. This looks incredible. And then you get it home and it's a fucking turd. So you take the gamble. But every now and then you come up with a gem, man. You the know, good thing, uh, though, is a lot of these guys also have streaming services, too. So before, like, you could, if you subscribe to that, you could check them out that way. And if you decide you want to get them on disc later, then you can. Yeah, exactly. for sure. I've been watching a lot on Arrow lately. I believe I'm not even exaggerating. I've, I've I own a lot of Arrow, anyways. Um, but I've I've literally gone. I've watched everything on their streams. <laughs> but <laughs> that is of interest to me, anyways. Like, yeah, and it's only like four or five ninety nine a month. I mean, between exactly, that, five six between that and Shutter, I mean, like I could get rid of Netflix, uh, Hulu, I- any of them. I could get rid of any of those easier than I could get rid of my Arrow or my Shutter. I'm blank. All of a sudden, it's not Midnight Vice. It's oh, what is it called? Damn it! Hold on. There's a streaming service that I I actually watch a lot because it's not just horror. They do a lot of Asian like Asian films, like cult films. Midnight Pulp. Um, which oh is, yeah, you can. It's both free and then you can pay five bucks and you know for the few movies on there that you have to be a thing. But I go to that all the time. And then you've got like Tubi which is, you know, just some free app and their fucking wealth of library 
especially for horror, is crazy. They I think they have a contract with either Vinegar Syndrome or Synapse or one of those, I, I, or maybe even yeah. both of them. I 100% I thought this exact same thing. But yeah, you'll find something on Tubi that hasn't been available for like 20 years and it looks like a brand new transfer of it. So it, it's got to be something like that. I got to search Tubi more. Yeah, definitely. I've been, yeah. I've actually been searching for, um, this is non Halloween related, but it's related to the, the companies that we're talking about. I, I've been working on a spaghetti Western idea and Arrow actually on their, on their app has some really good spaghetti westerns right now, but Tubi has a bunch of spaghetti westerns too. It's really proving to be like a, a rich ground of, of cult films on Tubi. Yeah, they they like two years ago, out of the blue, they went from just having like just that same red box trash that like most of the free like streaming services have to having all these like weird out of print. 80s and 70s horror movies and obscure cult shit and old 80s action films that like straight to video stuff but like yeah it just it's been weird but i check them out pretty regularly i i have too many stream- i think i i think i literally have every stream service it, <laughs> no it same feels that it's much. like um i actually noticed as far as like main franchise stuff peacock's got a lot of that stuff yeah and it's, it's great, too, because Peacock is, of course, owned by Universal. And I don't know yeah. how much of is it, how much of it is on there now. But I know when they launched, they had a ton of the classic Universal. They stuff still know. On. They still have a huge, okay. huge wealth of. Uh, but the last time we checked, they still don't have uh, the creature that walks among us. You, you know, the, the creature from the Black Lagoon sequel. Yeah. The one where he like, you know, he's all weirdly buff for some reason, wears clothes and walks around on land. Uh, yeah, he's, they, goes they, to Studio they, 54. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But yeah, it's like it's this weird. Really I would love bad, to see that. It's universally, but it's it's a bad movie. But I really like it, and I really want to rewatch it. But anyways, I have it. The thing is, I have it on a Universal collection. But just to go, you know, get that. Anyways, it doesn't matter. But um, <laughs> I love physical media, but I fucking hate walking to go get it and put it. Well, in so like, I, like, <laughs> I have. If I explain my setup. And the, the, you know, even the how my life works right now, where I'm basically sequestered in my office in my bedroom. And so, like, you know, the big TV and the nice Blu-ray players out there and I'm stuck in my room and I only have one USB cord. So I have to take out my Roku to put in my it's a whole it's a whole thing. Casey, don't judge me anyways. No, honestly, dude, like I have this that like it's like you got to move a stack yes. out, off one in front of the the shelf to get to the one you're trying 100%. to one hundred percent. So you're I like, so you're like, fuck it. This is on Netflix. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> uh, but if it if it was ever to disappear from Netflix, which it will, you've still got the movie. Yeah, that's the thing is it, like so. there's there's nothing permanent on any of these streaming services. So I like having immediate access to stuff, and it's also you know internet can go down, services can go down. It's like unless you're exactly unless your player's broken like you can watch it anytime so and it's going to be one of those things too where you know i feel like an archive of these things especially for boutique like small independent horror films that you know either release on video or you know even today like re- release to streaming once they go out of print you're never going to see them again if yeah. you're not if, if you're expecting to show up on streaming good luck so Having it, having it in your library, you know, I, I feel like it, you like it's almost like we're 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 archivists, where you know we're keep we're saving cinema history. But anyway, I almost feel like I'm a doomsday prepper for cinema. Yeah, <laughs> that's a good way. To it. <laughs> <laughs> it's like when the shit goes down and I have to leave, I can't go outside. I'm gonna be fucking ready. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I just keep on thinking like, okay, the internet may go down, but These please Blu-rays don't let don't the electricity bleed. go away. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's so true. I've thought of it that way before too. Like, I mean, this I'm being responsible in buying this. <laughs> I'm, I'm prepping for I Am Legend shit to go down with like as far as entertainment, like come here i have sanctuary i have <laughs> well, you don't want multiple make... box sets <laughs> speaking of i am legend you don't want to end up like charlton heston and the omega man where all he has to watch is woodstock <laughs> right <laughs> well you know the thing is though I, I i've said it before like my own uh my own existence is pretty much just back to back watching movies all day and like <laughs> sitting in one room so if the end of the world comes and i've got a bunker uh, nothing's really going to change just less fast food i guess 
Now, I do have a, a question before we move to wind up on this uh, special Halloween episode, but related to kind of what we were doing, do any of you guys have any particular memories of movies that you saw for the first time on Halloween? Absolutely. All right, let's hear it. Cre- Creature of the Black Lagoon. Ooh, good one. Oh, nice. And man, <laughs> it, yeah, like, saw it as a little kid, maybe 10 or 11. We wa- started watching it late, so I didn't get to see the first, like, 15 minutes of it. But seeing the creature underwater, it was hypnotic. And that's why, like, to this day, you know, I have a fucking home tiki bar that's creature themed. Like, it was very important to me. Um, my mom loved the monster movies, so she was really into all the universal stuff. And, yeah, it was very important. Like, it was very, like, formative, we'll say. Like, it was honestly probably one of my first real strong, like, horror memories is watching that on Halloween night. Like, right before the sun was going down before they were going to take us trick-or-treating. It was on KC, KCLA or whatever, KTLA, and just, it blew my mind. How old were you? I don't know, seven, eight. I mean, I don't know. I don't remember the exact age, but, I mean, old enough that it left. I still remember seeing it on our wood box TV, like, you know, the old, you know, wooden frame TV. Um, <laughs> I wasn't, I was still probably in Kaipa, so it was probably uh, seven, eight, nine, maybe. Wow. My, um, my favorite memory about Creature from the Black Lagoon actually happened recently. I'm still kind of going through all the Universal monster movies. I still haven't seen them all. I've only There's seen a lot. Yeah. Like, and I have that like 30 movie collections yeah. set that they put out or whatever. So yeah, I want that. Yeah. So kind of like the Vincent Price thing. It's like, I think I want to hit one of those every year too. So, but Creature from the Black Lagoon is one of my favorite ones of the ones I have seen. But my recent thing with it was i went to uh the new beverly cinema to one of their uh matinee screenings over the weekend uh, like la- it was either last weekend or the weekend before weekend before and um saw it in 3d like saw a print in 3d oh. and it's the first time i've seen kind of like a 50s 3d movie projected on a big screen so that was cool but like that movie is like has some really cool shit going in it. like that image of the creature like swimming underneath the woman. Yep. Like that's it, such a bitch in like image and so creepy. Like even though it's like a pretty tame movie, you know. Yeah, exactly. Because it's, it's so old, but like it's it's still like yeah. There's just a, like a lot of cool shit. A lot of the 3D effects, if you see it that way, are kind of fun. You know, just like real cheesy gimmicky stuff. But it was like I I really had fun with it, and um yeah, I could totally see like if that movie make an impression on you that young how it would stick in your craw for sure it's just so like beautifully shot when he's down amongst like the the, like the seaweed and shit like it's such great photography and the fact that and also you know russ browning who was the suit actor when he was swimming he's i mean last i heard he wasn't in great health and uh but he did all of that live in that costume swimming and it's it's just beautiful it's like it's weirdly like hypnotic and it's the fact that we were even able to do it is incredible, but yeah, it's 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 a really well shot, well made movie. It's just it's just a rubber suit monster movie, but it's fantastic. Yeah, it and is. it's I mean the creature is the greatest. I I will put him above the xenomorph till the day I die. Xenomorph is the second greatest design monster movie or movie monster, but the Gill Man hands down takes it for best design movie monster. Yeah, that's hard to argue. It's it's iconic. And it's also on top of having to be iconic and and frightening, uh, it also had to be very functional to work underwater yep. and to not drown the, the actor inside. Yep, so, exactly. you know, I mean, the, the xenomorph never had to be made on any real practical level. The whole idea was like, let's just make the scariest thing we can. That's right. And uh, there were a whole separate list of considerations in the Gill Man. So uh, it's impressive. It's still impressive. And I, who was it? Jack Arnold that directed that? Yeah, I think so. Please and I forget it. the name of the lady who did. She's a like such a badass. I'm blanking on her name, but look up the history of. Yeah, they wrote a book about her. What is her name? She was such an amazing name. human being and like uncredited for a long time. Like did all these different things. Was but yeah, she she was amazing and the, the artistry in that suit is just blows my mind the fact that it's 70 plus years or 70 around years old and it's still like holds up and it's still being merchandised and you know it's it's incredible 
you've still got stuffies for it at Dave and Buster's, you know? That's right. Exactly. <laughs> Millicent Patrick. Millicent Patrick. She is a true badass. What about you guys? What what movie did you see on Halloween that blew your mind? There's a couple of them for me. On on a just I'll I'll say it quick to mention it sort of level. Um, Halloween was the first time I saw Todd Browning's Freaks when I was 19. And that was that was a pretty good one. Um, That's a great one. But as far as like my big one in my childhood was probably Night of the Living Dead. I saw on Halloween. Oh. I also saw that for the first time on Halloween. I wonder if it was Weird. the same broadcast because, you know, we, we didn't live too far. We didn't know each other That's yet. Right. I want to say it was PBS or something like that. Or it was KVCR Channel 18 or it was it was one of these channels. It wasn't one of the big networks and it wasn't one of the big like HBO or Cinemax, which at the time was probably showing whatever blood and guts was brand new at the time. Um, so PBS was, you know, was taking the higher road with Night of the Living Dead, so to speak. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that was, that was a pretty moving experience for me. Just, it was, it was one of my first lessons in movie messaging, uh, because even as like a eight, nine, 10 year old, there, there was something powerful about having a, the black antagonist or the black protagonist, um, yeah. you know, in this setting and having to take charge of everybody in the room and, and of course, that ending and and how nihilistic all of that is. The message got through to me even at that young age as a white kid who was really just like far from woke, you know? Yeah. It was deep to me, very deep to me. And it taught me that that horror movies could be that way. And that was something that, you know, Romero continued to teach me as time went on. But yeah, it all started with Night of the Living Dead. That was my first exposure to that. The other one that I saw on um, Halloween that's that's horror adjacent, uh, but is certainly uh, noteworthy was the Rocky Horror Picture Show. I saw it for the first time on a Halloween. Nice. See, like, uh, do, like, do you qualify Rocky Horror Picture Show as a horror movie? I consider it horror adjacent, and I do consider Definitely. it a Halloween movie. Like, it's it's a horror. It's a it's a musical about horror movies. Uh, more and than I'm it's... not saying it's not. I mean, I leave that stuff up to to the to the, because it's funny because that is again. I mean, I watch that movie all the time, but <laughs> I have to watch it every Halloween. Like I have to. In fact, it's usually it will be usually like that or Monster Squad will be one of the first ones I watch during the season. I was going to bring up Monster mood. Squad too, but you and I have talked about Monster Squad so many times that would normally be my first choice for the ultimate Halloween movie. But yeah, Rocky Horror, it's it's another. And, and to call back to what Dick Dizel was saying about uh, saying last week, it's it's a scary musical. It's not a horror movie, but it's a scary musical. I mean, there's there's death. There's there's, uh, you know, dastardly scientific experiments. Um, you know, it's it's got some scary moments. I mean, I, I mean, I just I mean, you know, it's, to me, it's it's the fun it's the fun side of horror like it's you know it's like it's definitely obviously inspired by old whole i mean mainly science it's really it's mainly influenced by like frankenstein but may, a lot of science fiction but it's just that perfect vibe and stuff like well, well i could talk about rocky horror forever but anyways uh <laughs> but yes i i uh i love that uh love it uh, casey did you mention one i, I honestly I got to be I got to be dead honest like I can't think of anything that like I've seen on Halloween night that like was the first time that I saw anything. So what I'd like to do so I could hopefully lead into have you guys do the same is this, I just kind of want to quickly read off like some of the stuff on the list I compiled of stuff I think is stuff I watch regularly or quasi regularly every year Absolutely. and stuff that and stuff that you know I think has potential to be rewatchable in, in the near future. So um, I'll just go down the list. Anything else you guys want to elaborate on? Stop me. And I'll, we can get into it. Um, Evil Dead 2, we talked about um, the first three Halloweens. Like like Jim said, Halloween 2, it's not perfect, but it's fun. And actually, it has my favorite mask of Michael Myers with the blood tears. Yeah. yeah. That moment, I, re I really like the way that looks. And that um, opening with the uh, pumpkin opening up to a skull. I mean, yeah, that's, that's fantastic. Yeah. Nightmare on Elm Street, you can't go wrong. The original, for sure. It, Halloween's it's, made for Freddy Krueger. Yeah. Um, uh, Nightmare on Elm Street 3 is also 
super good. That's the best of the sequels, I think. Yep, one hundred percent. And um, it's really fun. Uh, Reanimator, Reanimator, uh, probably for the, a lot of the same reasons that like I like Evil Dead Two so much. It's like it's so gory, it's so crazy, but it's so funny, and yep. the performances are fantastic. New one I discovered probably within the last year or two that I really like, and I've probably watched maybe twice now is uh, Mausoleum. I haven't oh, yeah. seen that yet. Yeah, Mausoleum. Uh, I forget which company, which boutique label did it, um, but they they did a great disc where they cleaned it up and like the colors in that movie are just fantastic. And it's this really like weird 80s horror film, really kind of fun and just super 80s. Shout Factory recently, I think it was last week even, or maybe the week before, uh, finally released Wes Craven's Deadly Friend. Oh, um, yeah. <laughs> which... I, I don't know if I can say it's a great movie, but goddamn, it's, it's a so fun to watch. It's a 90-minute movie for one scene, but it's a great scene. Yeah, it? <laughs> like, it's, I mean, if it wasn't for that scene, it might as well have just been, like, Mac and me and shit. Like, it's exactly, just super, yeah. it's, but goddamn, it's so funny and so fun to watch. Um, as far as, like, genuinely terrifying, I got to give props to the original Candyman. I actually yeah. give props to the new Candyman, too. I thought it was really well done, but... Um, yeah, the original Candyman, super rewatchable. Um, if you haven't seen that, that's definitely worth looking into. One of the newer favorites of mine uh, is Overlord. I which was oh, the sci-fi one? I uh, no, that. it's the one uh, J.J. Abrams produced where it takes place in World War II. Yeah, it's like, it's yeah. Like the Nazi zombies. Zombies, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. really fun, really well done, really cool stuff going on in that. Um, I would yeah, check great. that out. Uh, there's a movie, it's not rewriting the book on anything horror but what it does it does well is uh hellfest okay i like hellfest i was yeah. actually gonna bring it up yeah hellfest is like really fun um and it's like a horror movie taking place inside of like a scary theme park much like halloween horror nights and stuff so that scenario is kind of fun definitely worth checking out uh critters one and two <laughs> are always fun um american werewolf in london yeah classic um, classic uh gotta give props to the shining and actually dr sleep but dr sleep's one of those movies even though it's like this you know the sequel to the shining it's like and there's scary stuff in it it's like is it really a horror movie it almost seems more like a like a drama or like a yeah. psychological thriller but definitely great uh i thought it was funny i genuinely thought this movie was cool when i walked out of it and i think it's funny that tarantino has been touting it it was his favorite movie of 2019 and that's crawl uh, which is uh, uh, yeah um, Filipino. No, no, crawl, no, no, crawl is the one where it's there's a it's flood the, happen and the gators the flood, trapped in the yeah. basement with them. The like, oh, that's right. I have not seen this, dude. No. That movie's really fun, and there's some really like fun, gory moments in it too. And it's like I said, it's it's not something that's reinventing the wheel, but it spins it like really well. <laughs> um, well uh, let's see what else I got. Uh, Black Sabbath, the uh, the old uh, anthology movie is really cool. I just with Karloff, yeah, with Karloff discovered that in the past like year or two. Uh, Dawn of the Dead, Romero's Dawn of the Dead, easily my favorite zombie movie of all time. The remake, actually, Zack Snyder's remake is actually really fun too. But I mean, if I had to choose, obviously, I'm going with the Romero one. Uh, what else? <laughs> They live. That's kind of like another one where it's like, is that a horror movie? It's more just kind of like I have argued on a different podcast that it is not, but that's yeah, why it's kind of just like a, it's political... a sci-fi action movie. Yeah, but it can be a Halloween. It can be a Halloween movie. Yeah, just because the aliens have the look that they do, it's like yeah, they're very very scary. Yeah. You could kind of forgive it. Uh, mentioned before, John Carpenter's a thing is epic, uh, fantastic creature effects and makeup effects for like the time that it came out. So good. Uh, creep show one and two yep i list. almost said creep show yeah yeah creep show is definitely one i watch pretty regularly on halloween fright night's fun uh, that was gonna be one yeah that's on my list too uh cabin in the woods even though it's kind of like making fun of horror films it's still great it's still great it's really fun to watch uh phantom of the paradise yeah but that over the rocky yeah yeah um uh, even though you said trick or treat the heavy metal one, um, I finally just got around last Halloween to watching the other trick or treat, the more kind of well known one with Sam, the little dude. Mm -hmm. That's a that's a really cool anthology movie, and I could see why people would watch that every year. Uh, talked about popcorn, Poltergeist. Yeah, can't Great go wrong. One. Can't go wrong. 
uh, it chapter one. I still uh, haven't seen chapter two. <laughs> I just say I like it left up. It is such a disparity between the two. It's it insane. really is, man. That first one is awesome, and, the, and there's cool stuff in the second one. But also the first, just... the the opening sequence of chapter two, which is like the beginning of the book. It's literally the beginning of the book. It's so well done, and then everything after that just it's a wet fart. Yeah, I, I remember that being movie, true though. of the miniseries too. The the miniseries, the second night could not live up to the first night. Yeah, I will. I, I will maybe agree with that, but to not to the same extent. I love the TV movie. I, I do too. It's it, its fault. I, I just, I haven't seen it chapter two yet. And, and I like, I'm interested in seeing Bill Hader, but I, I guarantee you had it had a better reputation, I would have seen it already. So it's been part of like a couple of nights ago, I had the option of like, okay, I can watch it chapter two or I can finally watch Dr. Sleep. And I took Dr. Sleep and I am so glad, like, what a good sequel that Dr. Sleep never fantastic. saw coming. Yeah, I, I think Dr. Sleep will grow in reputation over the next couple of decades. My guess is that you might actually, in like 20 years from now, a, another geek podcast that's not us, people debating which one is better because, you know, we, we don't want to go against Kubrick and Nicholson, you know, and, and all of that kind of stuff. But in terms of like putting some space front between the movies and and um, taking away the nostalgia that this movie that the original movie has for us, having you know seen it growing up. Doctor Sleep does handle itself on an independent level in in a way that's really interesting, and I think uh, I think you could make the argument that it's certainly more sophisticated than the first one, and it will probably come down to a matter of of individual taste. But I can totally see 20 years from now people debating which one is better. Yeah, like I wasn't expecting it to like it as much as I did. And I think, honestly, I think it's probably my one of my favorite movies of the year came out. And the way it melds the worlds of like the book Shining and Kubrick Shining together is pretty genius. Like if you like really think about it and like get down to it, you're just like that movie was way better than I was expecting it to be. And so props to Mike Flanagan for that, for sure. Uh, I will say this about it, though, in terms of the future argument of which one is better, and I, I prefer the Kubrick version. You don't have to see the other. You don't have to see Doctor Sleep to get the full experience of The Shining. If you haven't seen The Shining and you're going into Doctor Sleep, you're only watching half of Doctor Sleep. That's yeah, a fair that's point. A, yeah, that's a fair assessment for sure. Um, I would say that that's probably pretty. Most sequels, that's probably going to be the case, but. But um, I, I don't think I, I think it, it, it's an, on an even bigger level with this sequel because it's even more than like I just watched it uh, the night after I watched Halloween Kills. And it was like both films are so callback heavy, uh, yeah. not not just in their story points, but in their in their actual camera composition. And I can tell you every time it happened in Halloween Kills, even though I think it was fairly justified every time it happened in Halloween Kills, there was a, it was a little eye rolly. Whereas every time I saw it in Dr. Sleep, it was a little jaw dropping. Yeah. Yeah. There you go. That's fair. So I only got like five more titles here. Uh, I'm a big fan of Society by Brian Yuz- Love it. Oh, yes. Like it's one of the craziest body horror movies you can <laughs> ever see. The ending of this movie is something you you will not expect. And it's it's awesome. And like the stuff that it's like commenting on in its own like weird bizarre like b movie 80s way is just oh my god it, it's, it's so good truly truly unique like it there's nothing else like society uh e- even within brian yuzna's uh filmography there's not really anything else like society and, and me casey when we talked about society a couple of uh, months ago in a uh, another po- in our podcast about 1989 i raised something to, to james i'm going to ask you the same thing don't you think the the lead actor of society kind of feels like you're watching Emilio Estevez trying to do a Michael J. Fox impression. <laughs> <laughs> I never thought of that before, but now that you say it, I, I totally agree. <laughs> <laughs> He's good. He's doing fine, you know, for a low budget horror movie, but that kept on popping into my head. Wasn't he like on Baywatch or something eventually? Yeah, I he, think so. Yeah, I think the yeah. rest of his his filmography was was small screen. I think. Okay, so sorry. Uh, moving on, uh, really quick. Uh, you gotta give props to The Exorcist. Yeah. Um, 
I mean, the movie, I, I just saw it at the new uh, Academy Museum here in LA at the David Geffen Theater, which is probably my new favorite theater in LA. Like the damn thing has its own building, its own Dolby Atmos like system. It holds a thousand people. And the way it's designed is just really awesome. And then like Friedkin was there and he talked a little bit before beforehand and that was cool. But um, I didn't see this movie when I was a kid. Like the first time I actually saw it was in our high school film is lit class. Oh yeah, Mr. Like, Brugelette. Brugelette's <laughs> class. So I'm like 16 and we're watching this class and like I'm getting like creeped out in fucking school. I'm like, damn, this movie is like intense and like the stuff that happens in it and like the things the girl says, I'm just like, wow, man, that's crazy. Yeah, and just watching it again, like, you know, recently, it's like, this movie's still, like, ballsy, and it's still, like, good, and it's still, like, so well made, and the way it's shot, the way the, the way sound is used in it, how it's, like, you know, loud one moment, and, like, deep, super quiet the next, and, like, that, you know, yo-yoing going on, it's, like, it just, it just makes it for, like, a really unnerving experience, it's really cool. It's still shocking. Uh, I remember yeah. you and I went and saw it um, at that Warner Brothers 75th anniversary thing. We saw it at right. the Chinese theater. That right. was, no, that wasn't their midnight one. The Clockwork Orange was their midnight one, but we did get to see The Exorcist. It was the that. one before and uh, Freakin and Bloody were there, yeah. Yeah, and I remember we were in the lobby and at this point there had been a lot of, like there'd been Fangoria articles and a lot of fan chatter about this uncut version of the exorcist that William Peter Blatty claimed existed and that uh, William Friedkin said never happened or didn't, it was never the original cut. And I remember being in the lobby waiting to like get their autographs with you. And I'm curious if you remember the wording of this too, but I remember them asking us to give them a moment and turning to each other and Friedkin saying to Blatty, I can finally see where those scenes make sense now. And knowing, like, bearing witness to the moment <laughs> when those two yeah. got back together again. And then that turned into the uh, the re-release, the Exorcist, the version you've never seen, which he was very careful not to call the director's cut. Wait, well, yeah. And in the recent q and I saw them, too. He talks about, he's like, it might be the only, like, writer's cut of a movie ever. He's yeah. like, the only, he's like, the reason I did it was for him. You know, it's like, he was my good friend we he's like you know he called me up he's like warner brother found this footage why don't we go take a look at it and so they looked at it and like as they discussed it it's like okay i could see where we could probably make it work and so and so that's why that cut exists basically it was you know he's just like you know it was this argument me and blatty had for years like i just i basically just wanted to do it so that you know he can have his cut and people can decide which way they want to see it you know exactly and uh, if I can walk back a little bit what I said about The Exorcist earlier, if I sounded like I was coming down too hard on it, The Exorcist is absolutely a, a masterpiece. It's genius. I, I think part of what rubs me sometimes is kind of still the same sort of like, it's the scariest movie ever made. It's just like, I love Citizen Kane. I've written movies about Orson Welles. I still chafe whenever somebody calls it the best movie of all time. Cause I'm like, no, it's not. There's no such thing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I agree. With that. And, and so I do push on the exorcist sometimes just cause I'm like, okay, it, it's amazing. It's brilliant. I enjoy it every time I see it. It's not the greatest or the scariest horror film ever made. Cause that does not exist. <laughs> so yeah, I don't know why I feel obligated to take it down a peg. I maybe shouldn't, but. I will acknowledge it is a masterpiece. <laughs> and then um, the only ones I have, uh, I really like the 80s remake of The Blob. Yes, 88 Blob is fantastic. That was almost on my list too. Yeah, I mean, the original Blob's great too, as far as like 50s horror movies goes. That's that's definitely up there for sure. It has, uh, it honestly has the scariest movie monster of all time in Kevin Dillon. But... Uh, <laughs> 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 But yes, Shots or cast heroic lead in any movie ever with his fucking caveman face and his bad mullet. I hate it. But the movie's <laughs> great. It's fucking disturbingly gross and incredible, and I love it. Yeah. I like to bring up uh, James Gunn Slither. Oh, yeah. Um, super fun. Really fun. It's a, much like Evil Dead 2. It's a nice balance of gore and like humor. Like they're definitely in on the joke and the characters are funny. And so it's really entertaining. I highly recommend that. And then um, uh, the last one on my list, and I'm, I know 
and both of you will appreciate, but I know Jim especially is uh, maximum overdrive. Yeah, <laughs> maximum overdrive. Like, uh, I I shouldn't like a movie as much like this bad as much as I do, but it's it's so fun. It's super eighties. Like, tr- uh, vehicles and electronics are <laughs> taking over and have like their own mind and turning on humans, and it's and again it's, it goes in there with the trapped in a trapped in a house scenario where they're trapped in this diner and are trying to get out and uh yeah it's so funny it's the only movie stephen king ever directed and you'll see why <laughs> and- <laughs> yeah, to this day i do not get what people's problem with it is it's i still think it's i don't know it's i mean i i get why people don't like i love i kind of love it for every reason people hate it like <laughs> so there's a lot of there's, a lot Sam- of doesn't make any sense but the conceit doesn't make sense it's not really but yeah, yeah you can definitely feel cocaine was the. Yeah, the, I mean the it's absolutely ridiculous, but it's so fun and it's so yeah. hilarious. Like, I mean, if you watch the trailer for it, you will see Stephen King at at his most coked out. Yeah, I have a one sheet poster of it where it's literally Stephen King holding puppet strings, and the puppet strings <laughs> are attached to the characters below. And I'm like, I saw it at Dark Delicacy store here in Burbank, and I'm like, I can't not own that poster. Like, that's incredible. I had it it's up in the, my office. I will go down in the record as Yardley Smith being one of the most unlikable film characters in fucking yeah. film history. <laughs> I never wanted a character to die as much as her. Um, right. But yeah. No, agreed. Absolutely. Pat Hingle's really fun in that too. Yeah. Oh, he's Pat, great. Super redneck. <laughs> like, exactly. Do, does it Second well. Most hated. <laughs> anyway, that's my list. There's a hundred more great horror films we could talk about, but you guys, please. Uh, we'll pass the baton over to one of you guys. So, do you have any more to add, James? Well, I mean, obviously, for for me, I mean, there's, I mean, there's so many, and, and you know, like for me, Halloween, like I said, it doesn't like Texas Chainsaw Massacre is one of the greatest horror films yeah, ever made. Like, that would definitely be on my list for sure. But for me, that's a horror movie I watch all year long. It doesn't, you know, it's sunlit, it's dusty and sweaty. That doesn't necessarily scream Halloween to me, even though I will usually watch it during the Halloween. To me, like Halloween has to have some sort of a movie like Suspiria. Suspiria is a know, great Halloween movie. Yeah. Yeah. Black Sabbath. There's a lot of like, you know, I like atmosphere, but I will, there's so many we could talk about. Obviously, this, you know, could go on forever. And you mentioned like a few, I, I, you know, Fright Night, which I think is such a perfect horror movie. It's just Fright Night is all one of my all time favorites, Lost Boys. But I want to talk about two modern films because you did mention Hellfest. One movie I want to talk about is um, Terrifier which is the is it the, the second clown. yeah art the clown so it's to me though the reason i like terrifier so much and it, it again takes place on halloween night but is it such a modern brutal modern slasher it is so it's such a evolution of 80 slashers and the 80s you know slasher villains but taken you know up a little bit of a notch but you know it's is it a great movie? No, but is it is it a engaging slasher movie? Yes, and it's the the violence is pretty gnarly. But more than anything, Art the Clown in the performance of that character, and at this point, scary clowns are one of the most tired, worst cliches in in all of film. Scary clowns, but Art the Clown just is in a whole other league, and he's so creepy, and he carries the whole film just sitting there with the, the expression on his face, and it's a combination of the great makeup design as well as the great performance but the other one i want to talk about has become a real favorite in the last three years uh very much like hellfest where hellfest takes place at, like what you would see like as like a you know not scary farm or a, a ho- halloween horror nights like a big it's basically a slasher film set in like a big like haunted hotel. hayride type place yeah this movie haunt which to me is one of the most effective modern slashers genuinely really creepy and disturbing um, while still having a sense of fun and style to it. I'm not going to give anything away because, you know, um, that's not what we do here, but there's a lot of like classic Halloween iconography with some of the like characters. And then that even gets turned on its head towards the end of the third act. And there's just, but the violence is very disturbing. It's actually like, you know, it's got a lot of the classic 80s slasher cliches of like the unlikable loud mouth and the like, floozy you know, there's all these different archetypes in it but it really works because you play up those expectations and then they really deliver on evolving those you know sort of archetypes but 
it's honestly I watch it all the time. It's it's when I watched it on Shudder for the first time, I really put it on expecting to not like it. And I was literally probably like looking at my phone or something. And five minutes into it, I was fully engrossed and just sort of in the atmosphere of it. And uh, I, I really enjoy it. I bought that disc from Ronin uh, either last year or the year before, and I still haven't put it on. So I'm definitely going to. Did you get that, that box set with like. Yeah. The, yeah, I got that. Yeah. Cause, and I, I, I bought it because I loved the movie and I was going to buy the cheaper version, but I'm like, let me just get it. In fact, it's, I'm literally looking at it. I think they were having, I think they were having like a sale or something. And I read like reviews on it and it was, you know, really pretty well reviewed. And, and the premise it's sounded. For a modern slasher movie, it's pretty, pretty good, dude. Yeah. It's and got the like premise. A little twist ending. Yeah, and the premise sounded cool, so I was like, oh, I'll, I'll, I'm going to pick this up. So, yeah, I definitely got to get on that. Give me the title one more time. I haven't seen this one. Haunt, H-A-U-N-T. Okay, I will check that out for sure. What about you, Devin? I've got a couple more to to add to the pile, I guess. First off, I, I just want to see if anybody else thinks my theory would stick. I think had Halloween 3 been a success and John Carpenter got to proceed with his anthology dreams of the Halloween series, I think Prince of Darkness would have fit really well as a Halloween movie. Having the day that all of that happens being Halloween would have been a very easy script change and the rest of the movie could have been identical. I'm mad I didn't, I forgot about Prince of Darkness and that I haven't even watched it yet. So... (laughs) I live a poster of it 10 feet from me. That It's one of my all-time favorites. And like I said, I've, I've talked about this on this podcast that I think it might be in my top two favorite Carpenter films. But I will say, I, I as far as Halloween goes, I don't feel it's a proper Halloween unless I've seen a Carpenter film outside of Halloween. Like whether it's The Thing or whether it's Prince of Darkness yeah. or In the Mouth of Madness, which is another great one. Uh, it's, yes. uh, like we said, I mean, we talked about, we did a whole episode about Carpenter, but yeah, like that, he's, he's like the quintessential guy for me as, yeah. as far as Halloween. Even things goes. like Christine and stuff, which hasn't, does, is no longer as in favor as it was years ago. It's a great Halloween movie. The, the soundtrack, all the, yeah, the fog. I mean, yeah, he, Carpenter sort of, yeah, he's stamped it, which is why he was the perfect one for the, you know, our, our first annual halloween episode so exactly i mean i think if he had not made the original halloween john carpenter still would have owned the holiday yeah and, I, and yeah i can sure. agree with that um but as far as uh some of the classics go i i know i i tend to pick black and white stuff more often um but i i really love the black cat which uh the, the universal classic one I, this one isn't one this one isn't on the uh the 30 no. the 30 set um, because it's not one of their classic monsters, but it is a universal classic horror movie. Uh, and it stars Bella Lugosi and Boris Karloff uh, in one of the rare instances where Bella is actually got a they bigger do. role than Boris. Uh, but <laughs> but Boris also has a great co-star, which is his hair in that movie. Um, <laughs> it, it It's it's weird because it's gothic, but it's also very, um, oh, what, what would you call it, James? It's uh, art, art deco design. So, exactly. Right? And eschewing the classic Gothic uh, architecture and stuff, it's in this fully modern for the time, beautiful Art Deco mansion, but and still he, dripping with atmosphere. And Karloff's haircut is even Art Deco. Like, yeah, uh, it's it, it's it's really strange. Um, Lugosi is a uh, a former prisoner of war who is returning to the land that he fought on and and meeting up with his tormentor in the in the prisoner in the POW camp played by Boris Karloff and you just you never quite know how this is going to go and of course there's a married couple stuck in between that's very uh you know Ozzy and Harriet before there was an Ozzy and Harriet you know there had to be the the young American couple or else there wasn't going to be any universal monster money <laughs> but but the stars of this are clearly Bella and Boris and uh, they both do a really capable job. Um, Bella, for once, playing a protagonist. And uh, don't be fooled. It's called The yeah. Black Cat. Uh, it is, they claim it's based on the Edgar Allan Poe story. Neither is really true. Uh, the only tie to it, and I feel like they just kind of threw it in because someone at some point said, hey, fellas, think we should put a black cat in this movie called The Black Cat? Uh, so Bella Lugosi's character has like this crippling phobia of cats and so whenever the cat you know boris karloff's cat comes into the room bella does 
for as good of a job as he does, every time he acts scared of the cat, it is like drop dead funny. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but it, it's leading up to a conclusion where these two old like warriors are going to to go toe to toe. And I'll just say what what happens with Boris Karloff's character, especially for the time, is just skin curling. It's <laughs> clever use of that yeah yeah james is laughing because he he knows that yeah. there's a pun in there somewhere but, yes. <laughs> but uh yeah it, atmospherically it is one of my favorite movies to watch on a on a halloween um i really love blackula it, it's maybe silly at points I, blackula and scream blackula scream <laughs> Makes for a fun double feature. Uh, William Marshall plays Blackula, and he's he's probably better known to our generation as the King of Cartoons from Pee Wee's Playhouse. Oh, the nice. second King of Cartoons, but yeah, the second King of Cartoons. But he um, he takes that. He's so good in it. He takes what is clearly exploitational, like drive-in trash, and he performs it in a way where you actually your heart breaks for Blackula a little bit. You know, he plays it very sympathetically, even though he's the heavy. His performance actually is what makes that movie kind of transcend to almost classic levels. And, and then you get Dracula naming him Blackula, which is just the dumbest. Like, <laughs> yep. I don't know how that flew <laughs> even then. Uh, but in the, in the prologue, in the beginning of the movie, the I, I can't, Prince Garmundi? I can't remember what his original name is, but he's a prince. Hey, you're right there. He's going to visit Dracula and Dracula bites him and says, I dub the Blackula. And I'm just like, Dracula's just feeling funny that night or particularly well, racially Dracula's insensitive. A, Dracula's <laughs> a slave. He's he's a, he's in the slave market. He's into human trafficking, basically. That's literally the beginning of the movie. Like, and yeah, it's uh, but I, I tried to, cause I, I said that I, a few years ago, we were doing at my work, we were doing this, uh, I'm not going to the whole story, but basically I was on a pot internal work podcast about, uh, we were te- teaming up with all these different like clubs, ERGs, we call them internally. And one of them was our, like our, our I, I only use the term because it, anyways, but I was basically talking about the, you know, the history of, of black cinema where it, you know, sort of crosses horror and important black horror films. And I talked about Black Dilla, and the two people that were sort of hosting this sort of looked at me like I was joking. And I was like, look, I know, you know, if you've only heard the name, you know, I know the reaction. But I'm like, it's the genuinely like there's some, I mean, yes, it's very 70s. It's very much, you know, a lot of it is what you think. But it's genuinely, he is a sympathetic character. He's a, has regality. He's a, you know, like there's, they're really fun movies. And they're not just like, you know, and. But I was like, it was like walking this tightrope of trying to explain to people who <laughs> just know it by the type name. And I was like, it's don't, I was like, don't judge. It's, it's, they're good films, but anyways. And, and it's still a better title than Blackenstein, which is also yeah. a movie. Yes. Mm-hmm. Um, and nowhere near as good. Nowhere near as good. Uh, Blackula really, I mean, it's, it's ably performed and it's, it's ably directed. It's, it's, there's parts of Blackula that are very good movie, um, but it, it's still, it, it can't ex- escape its uh grindhouse origins yeah. completely i mean there's lots of prostitutes and yeah it's like- yeah and, and i will say this in its defense it's uh racist white dracula at the beginning is not nearly as racist as the dracula in old dracula with <laughs> david niven so yeah. <laughs> which which is just needlessly racist um i don't know if you guys have ever seen that i haven't Dude, okay. I like the term needlessly racist. Yeah, as if it has a need anywhere else. Yes. <laughs> uh, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> um, I, I just mean, uh, I'm not even going to go into that. Um, but no, old Dracula, David Niven is playing, as the title implies, old Dracula. Um, and he's bringing his wife back to life. He has to like kill a certain number of people and use their blood to bring, to reincarnate his wife. And when he does it, um, his wife is reincarnated as black. And so leading him to think that someone must have been fooling around with the bloodline of the people that he was uh, collecting from. 
and some, you know, kind of what the way they treated it is that some recessive genes snuck through or something. It's, it's really insensitive. And so he's very clear on that. This does not bother him as Dracula to have a black wife, but what will people think when he goes out with her, which is, I, they'll think that you're a fucking vampire and it won't matter. Like, like, why are you worried about what <laughs> society's going to think of you if you walk around with a black wife? It's really fucking tasteless. Um, so he's spending the whole entire movie is him trying to, uh, he and his wife together, helping him to find another body to transfer her to. And by the end, she decides, and this is how they quote unquote validated by the end she decides she's quite happy with this body and that dracula needs to shape up and so they do kind of a spin on it and now david niven he finds his perfect solution <laughs> cuts to david niven in blackface going out with his wife like oh my god <laughs> it's insane that this movie was even made it's wow it's so insensitive it's so but you can tell that they're completely clueless when they're making it. And, and I mean, even the, the title is ridiculous. It had a different title, but then Young Frankenstein came out and they thought, oh, that'll make a good double bill. Old Dracula and Young Frankenstein. Frankenstein. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. So for chunks of 1974 and 1975, that was a legitimate double feature people could check out, which is really co- setting up one of the smartest, most beautifully shot horror comedies of all time and pairing it with one of the worst films ever made Piece of the shit. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah that is the tale of old dracula <laughs> please no email please let's not end the podcast on that <laughs> actually uh, can i bring up like two movies that are actually like fairly i just saw that are fairly newish yes please do let's <laughs> um so uh, i recently saw uh titan Oh, the Julia DeCorno movie. I just rented it. I haven't watched it yet. Yeah, really good. Like crazy, gnarly body horror. Super weird movie, but really cool. Like I, me and my wife saw it. My wife was, wasn't really into it because it's just so weird and gnarly. But I was kind of into it. I think DeCorno like, is definitely like, she might be able to take the mantle of body horror from Cronenberg, man. It's, it's really nope. good, really good stuff. And the other one I saw, which is just really silly, but I enjoyed this movie way, way more than I should have. And that movie is Willie's Wonderland with Nicolas Cage. <laughs> I did see that. Yeah, like, I mean, it's basically Nicolas Cage in a Five Nights at Freddy's video game scenario where there's evil animatronic puppets in this defunct, like, Chuck E. Cheese type restaurant, and he's got to fight him so he doesn't get eaten and whatnot. <laughs> and, <laughs> It's it's ridiculous, but it's everything. If you watch the trailer, it's everything that you would want from that movie. They exceed, and it's it's it was just really fun. And so, if you're looking for like a stupid B movie to watch, I definitely recommend Willie's Wonderland. Have you seen that one yet, James? Yeah, I talked. To, I thought we talked. I might have talked about it on a different podcast. Yeah, it's we did. We I talked about no... it during the double feature of Nicolas Cage, but I couldn't remember if you had seen it or not. Yeah, it's. Uh, I went into it thinking I was not going to enjoy it, and then I was like, "This, this is so goddamn perfectly stupid that, like, at the end of it, I was like, <laughs> I want to see a sequel. I just want to see that character in different scenarios, just not saying anything and just being badass." So it's almost like the best. I mean, outside of Toxic Avenger, probably like the best trauma movie ever made. That's not trauma. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. That's a pretty good way of putting it. I I enjoyed it. I, I will say this in criticism. Every single scene that Nicolas Cage is in is fantastic. And it's the reason to watch the movie. He's, yeah. It's so weird. It's so goofball. But and then, it, then it turns serious all of a sudden. Like, I mean, it gets not serious necessarily, but like he gets down to business when he needs to get down to business. Every scene that Nicolas Cage was not in, I didn't like at all. Yeah. But, I mean, <laughs> the other talent, like whatever. But I Cage did what he needed. There's to this, that sex scene, though, that that's the low point in the movie because it just first off it's like you know you're gonna do a sex scene everybody's got still has their clothes on i'm like i just so that's such an obvious movie thing not that i'm just trying to see a bunch of people naked i'm just saying like it don't even what's the point but <laughs> it's also like people are dying and they're in this scary place and later they're gonna it's so dumb it just took me out of the movie but 
uh, yeah, I mean, by the end of the movie, the very end of it, I was fully sold. Did you guys, real quick, did you see the Banana Splits horror movie? I did. Yeah. What do you think of that? That was fun for like a direct to video movie for sure. Yeah. I mean, it was like fun. Exactly. It wasn't. That would be a shape, that would be a good double feature. That's why like, I was exactly yeah. what I was thinking. Lotus thinking Wonderland there. and the Banana Splits horror movie for sure. It was a. I was a little disappointed in that, but I don't know that it, it's. I don't know how good you could have made that you, movie. I, <laughs> again, that, that's kind of what I'm saying. Like, I don't. I don't think that I can really make a statement like uh, I had higher expectations of it because um, I didn't. But. I think maybe because it was the actual banana splits and I, I was more thinking of like, what would I do with the banana splits? Whereas Willie's Wonderland was creating its own thing. Like, yeah, uh, both Even movies, it- I think both movies started their lives as Five Nights at Freddy's movies and couldn't get the yes. rights. And so, well, from what I know, even though it seems like the obvious, I, I think from what I read, Willy, Willie's Wonderland wasn't that, even though you would think that's exactly what it was. I, from what I remember reading at the time, it had no, it was just, I mean, maybe it was influenced by it, but wasn't ever planning to be an actual. Okay. But I think on the opposite head, I do think, I mean, from what I remember, the Banana Splits movie was supposed to be Five Nights at Freddy, and then they turned into something different. Something like uh, that. That's funny. But I, I remember even thinking, like, even, at, like, because it's self-aware. It's not a dumb horror movie, like, yeah, yeah. the way that, you know, Ed Wood is a dumb horror movie or, you know, any of that. It, it's it knows what it's doing and it knows where it's going and it knows where it's coming from. And so I felt like for the banana splits movie to actually be the real banana splits and, and to, to have that canon to work with, I would have done things very differently. Um, and that's kind of where I was with uh, Willie's Wonderland too, in terms of loving the Nicholas Cage stuff, but everything else around it was too stupid to make me feel like the Nicholas Cage stuff was brilliant. I don't like, know. If you that know, makes I sense. Say, there's a few moments in, in the movie there and remember there's this at, when they're all those like teenage kids were on the roof where some of the dialogue actually kind of impressed me that there was a self-awareness to the dialogue where they're like oh they were self-aware so they were definitely poking fun at everything like that they, they were definitely like oh well this is a horror movie there's got to be a sex scene but i felt like every joke that they made was a joke that i've heard five other times better oh, yeah, in other self-aware movies What I hadn't seen before was Nicolas Cage playing a uh, mute going nuts on a bunch of animatronics. And that was fucking worth the price of admission right there. Yeah, in the middle of all that, he's fighting fucking animatronic demons. And then he has his his alarm set when there's when it's break time it's break time he just it's break time. puts down the fight and goes and plays pinball and drinks his so his cute. energy drinks and 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 i think that that stuff was so smart and weird and kind of subversive and makes you wonder what is this filmmaker trying to get at and then for it to just be like tacky cheesy freddy versus jason teenagers it was all done better in freddy versus jason when they were making fun of that stuff like the jokes were old so to me, I, I would just fast forward through anything that didn't have Nicolas Cage in it. <laughs> Isn't that most Nick Cage movies? <laughs> no comment. <laughs> well, I mean, I think that's a good good place to end it. You know, like, again, you know, talking about horror movies and Halloween, like, there's how many it's years? It's conversation. Or... Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But, I mean, I, 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 I'm so glad we were able to get to do this, Casey. I'm so glad you were able to come back. This will definitely. Oh, this is great, great, man. I'm always happy to be on here talking to you guys. Well, you, you are permanently <laughs> invited, as far as I'm concerned. Absolutely. But, uh, Devin, anything you want to say before we end it? Uh, yeah. Uh, just to close us out, I would like to point out that everyone should still go to voltagevhs.com and uh, pick up some uh, voltage VHS lamps of your favorite horror movies. Yes, please. And also check us out on Instagram at Voltage VHS Lamps. And you can see videos of some of like the custom work we do as well. But um, yeah, we've got a lot of movies. Got mine right here. Yeah, yeah. (laughs) Alone. I've got mine 10 feet that way. (laughs) Uh, So yeah, they make great uh, home decor, especially for Halloween. So come check us out. I think I'm going to actually put mine kind of towards my window so that I can have a strobe sort of thing out my window on Halloween. Nice. Oh, there you go. So thanks again, right, guys, Casey, for been... joining us. Thank you, guys. Always a pleasure. We'll have to do it again soon. And uh, for all the rest of you guys out there, make sure you're checking your candy for razor blades. And uh, happy Halloween. Happy, happy Halloween, Halloween everyone. <laughs>